Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by S. Wallace Edwards and Sons, third generation cure masters producing the country's best dry cured and aged hams, bacon, and sausage. For more information, visit SurreyFarms.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. Welcome back to Ferment About It, a show about home fermentation with an emphasis on home brewing. I'm your host, Mary Izette. My co-host, Chris Kuzme, is still in Hong Kong, but he'll return in 2013. Um, And tonight we're going to talk about two brewing historical styles. So this is a follow-up to last week's show in which I played an interview um, that I did with Dr. Fritz Bream, who makes the amazing 1809 Berliner Weiss style beer and the Greditsky, a uh, Gretzer, po- uh, an ancient, basically Polish style of beer. Um, and we're going to talk about how to brew those styles of beer at home. So I am very lucky to have two guests. We have Jesse Ferguson of Carton Brewing. He's the head brewer at Carton Brewing, calling in to talk to, uh, to us about kettle souring. He made a fantastic Berliner style beer this year that I absolutely adored. It's Monkey Chase the Weasel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I also have... Um, Home brewer extraordinaire Matt Chan with me. Hi, Matt. Hello, hello. I'm here. And uh, so, and he's brewed both Gretzer and Berliner Weiss, as I, have I. So let's actually, we're going to go straight to. We're starting a little bit late today, so I'm actually going to bring Jesse right in. Hey, how y'all doing? Good. Hey, Jesse. Hey, how Jesse. are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for agreeing to be on. So, tell me about um, your beer, Monkey Chase the Weasel. Um, it was a uh, an American sour, um, and yeah, it was definitely inspired by um, Berliner Weisses, um, although it definitely technically is not a Berliner Weiss. Um, it was about uh, 3.9, 4.1% ABV. Uh, we brewed it last um, June and released it in June, um, and... Um, you know, people people seem to like it. We were real big fans of it. Um, we like sour beers, and we like low gravity session beers. And so, the Monkey Chase the Weasel fit the bill on both of those. Great, yeah, it was a delicious beer. Now, um, tell us a little bit about well, what inspired you to make this beer first of all. Back door. So uh, every single person who walked in during the construction <laughs> of our brewery stomped through these mulberries that were on our back stoop and then stomped them into, our, into the brewery. So we were looking at the floor and we were like, well, there's mulberries in the brewery. We might as well put mulberries in the beer. <laughs> Excellent. And tell us, so we're, we're talking about, um, I think you heard the intro. So we're talking about how to brew Berliner Weiss and Berliner Weiss style beers and then Gretzer, Gretzer style beers today. So you did something unique to get your, to get the sourness in the Monkey Chase the Weasel. What was that? Um, so when we first sort of set about the task of figuring out how to do, um, to sour the beer, we, we tried, we have a 20 gallon pilot system and we initially tried uh, brewing up 20 gallons of wort and then separating that 
um, into four different carboys. Uh, with three of them received different levels of lactobacillus culture along with primary yeast. One, one received just lacto and one received um, different level and then two received different level of lactobacillus. And then the fourth carboy, we actually, we, rack, we, we transferred the work that we had, um, you know, run off from the mash time into what was, I guess, our, uh, our hot liquor tank on our pilot system and then held it at um, uh, around 100 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three days and then until we tasted sourness that we were, that we were happy with and then boiled that and put it into a carboy and then fermented it with a, our, our house uh, California ale yeast. Okay. And the results of that first experiment were that the, 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 the beer that we liked the best of those four was the one that we had did the kettle souring with. So we then moved forward on a series of additional experiments on our pilot system, uh, upwards of, of seven or eight different batches, I think we did, um, where we just kept experimenting with different uh, ways to sour in the kettle um, until... You know, I'd say May of last year when we we went ahead and moved forward with uh, that technique on our big system, and we brewed two 15 barrel batches on our on our 15 barrel brew house and filled a 30 barrel fermenter with work that we had soured in the kettle, and then fermented with our house California ale yeast, and that was basically the beer. Great, and you you said you, so. How did you um how did you incorporate the um or add the sourness into the kettle? You said by adding lactobacillus directly? No, okay. So when, what we did was we would run the word off of the, uh, we would lot of the word out, mm-hmm. um, out, of our, out of our mash time, lotter time, and into the kettle, and then chill the word down to lacto temperature. So, um, 100 degrees right in the Fahrenheit. Name, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically nine, uh, 100 Fahrenheit. Um, purge the kettle. Uh, we're, we were lucky to have a kettle that has a, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty tight seal on the manway um, and has a CIP arm that we can put a valve on. So we purged the, the kettle with CO2. Mm-hmm. And then we actually inoculated the lacto directly with uh, base malt. So we okay. threw in a, a few pounds of base malt and just let the lacto do its thing on, on our pilot system. We had done, like I said, a number of experiments, and we got pretty consistent results mm-hmm. with, without having to use a lacto culture. Um, although I, I do say, going into that first fifteen barrel batch, it was still pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> you know, not not sure if we were going to get the same results on a much larger scale or not. But uh, the next day we came in, and the temperature in the kettle had held pretty consistent, you know, right around where it needed to be. And we opened up the manway, and there was good four to six inches of croissant on top from the, the lactobacillus fermentation that was occurring. And we took a sample, and we were definitely getting up towards the uh, the tart side of, of where we were headed. So we ended up doing it, doing uh, resting in the kettle for two days, and then just basically bringing it to boil um, and doing a really short boil and just throwing a handful of hops in and then proceeding forward with it as we will with any other beer. Great. Yeah, well, it is a delicious beer. Now, are you guys planning on brewing this in the future? Well, yeah, we've actually got... We, we were really happy with it. And for us as a small brewery, um, we all love sour beers, but we're, 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 we're not to the size yet where we can have complete redundancy in order to have a sour side and a, and a non-sour side. So... We've been experimenting with with a handful of different flavors um, that we can use the same technique on. Um, we actually brewed a sour stout, which we're calling Super Storm Sandy Sour Stout, because we the Sunday before the storm, we started the process. We mashed and ran off and inoculated with the base malt. And then with, with the plan to come in on the Tuesday morning of the storm and boil it and put it into fermenters and we have our brewery which is located on the Bay Shore side of um, the North Jersey Shore lost power for 
seven days. So it ended up souring in the kettle for just over seven days. Wow. We came in. First thing we did when we got power back on was boil it, pitch yeast, and, and cool it down to pitch yeast into it. So it's basically our milk stout recipe that mm-hmm. we soured um, and took about three pitches of yeast to finally get it to, to ferment out. But what we have now is our, our like I said, Storm Sandy Sour Stout. And uh, we're doing an event on the 27th at a, a venue near the brewery in Highlands. Our brewery is in Atlantic Highlands, but the, the, the event is going to be at a venue, uh, bar called the Chubby Pickle. And it's a benefit for one of our other favorite local tap houses called Twin Lights Tap House, which got completely flooded by the storm. So we're going to tap two, the only two kegs of that sour stout that night, and then all the proceeds go to support the folks from Twin Lights Tap House who are trying to get their their tap house back open. Oh, great. Um, so we've done that, and like I said, that one was, is super interesting because in that seven-day period in the kettle, I think a lot more started happening than just Back to yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, so it's got some interesting complexities going on, um, and then it's and it's like I said, it's you know it's five percent ABV milk style basically. Um, so it's got a lot going on, um, and then we have some other iterations of uh, sort of monkey chase the weasel. We have uh, we plan on brewing monkey chase the weasel again for release again in June of this year. Um, and then we're working on one right now that um, is called Intermezzo, and it's the same base beer, but rather than using with um, the mulberry in, in at the end in knockout and in the bright tank, we're going to be using wasabi and green apple. So we've just brewed the first pilot of that, and we haven't even tasted it yet. So you know who knows where that's right. going to go. That sounds we're hoping very interesting somewhere. and fantastic. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us. So just Carton is, as you said, it's in Atlantic Highlands. You guys are open to the public on which days? We're open for tours, tastings, and growler fills Thursdays and Fridays from 5 to 7.30 and um, Saturdays and Sundays from 12 to 5. And, um, you know, for any of the home brewers out there, you know, I'm, I'm there pretty much every Sunday brewing on our, our pilot system. So we're always happy to have people stop by and, and check out the uh, the operation and, and we're always pouring at least one beer that we've brewed on our pilot system in our tap room too so you can always taste what we what the newest experiments are so great and then i will add a link to um foment about it our foment about it com page for your event on the 27th so anybody can um go to our website and find out about that um, awesome and yeah no i listen i listened to the, the bream interview and pretty incredible yeah. uh, what he was talking about i think our technique is is a, is it's sort of out of necessity and practicality in terms of running a small production brewery in the state so yeah but uh, but very effective i mean the monkey chase of weasel is a delicious beer you get that nice sourness it was you know very refreshing low gravity so i think you guys are doing it right thanks so much Mary. thanks Great. for having me on all right i hope to see you soon jesse yep bye-bye Talk to y'all later bye So, awesome. I think we might be around 15 minutes. I don't know. We're, we're started late, so... Yeah, so we're going to take a break now, and we'll be back. Um, we are listening to Foment About It on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Today's program has been brought to you by S. Wallace Edwards & Sons. Edwards Suriano hams are aged to perfection for no less than 400 days and hickory smoked to achieve a deep mahogany color. The Edwards name is well known for its world-class aged and cured meats. 
their exclusive curing and aging recipe produces a unique flavor profile that enhances the quality characteristics of Berkshire pork. Optimum amounts of pure white fat marbling contribute to a flavor that's a delicate, perfect balance between sweet and salty. For more information, visit www.surreyfarms.com. Hey, welcome back. You're listening to Foment About It on Heritage Radio Network. We broadcast live every Monday at 7 p.m. I'm Mary Izette, uh, your host. And tonight I, we're talking about brewing Berliner Weisset style beers and Gretzer style beers. So the first 15 minutes we, we had an interview, phone interview with Jesse Ferguson from Carton Brewing. And he talked about how to sour in the kettle. I think that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Matt Chan is with me. So Matt, tell me, when did you start home brewing? I started brewing, brewing about uh, two and a half years ago, so, yeah. And since then, I've moved on to doing lots of interesting styles, including yeah. German devices and Gretz. <laughs> so, I will say something. I don't know how long ago I met you, but I can remember, every. I always end up at some event, like the Brooklyn Ward or something, and Matt always has these growlers of something, and it's always something extremely interesting and very tasty. So... Um, I know we talked about doing a Gretzer and a Berliner Weiss, so mm-hmm. let's go ahead and we're probably going to run out of time today to talk about, to really cover this subject, but we can always return at a future date. But let's talk about how you brewed your Berliner. I think it's pretty similar to, to the Berliner that I brewed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, um, I basically did um, really simple infusion, a two-step infusion, just like protein rest and sacrification at, like, I think, 133 and then later at 150. Uh, one, I think, mm-hmm. like that, and um, I ran it off. I I think for the, f- the f- I did two Berliner Weisses actually. So but the first one, I actually just boiled it for like fifteen minutes to kill off anything, and then I actually pitched the uh, Berliner blend. Um, okay, right. And after I'd done that one, I wasn't really uh, as happy with the sourness. It never came through, so I just think it wasn't the blend they had didn't have enough lacto. So mm-hmm. I kind of went back to the drawing board and kind of did what. I think you did, um, maybe. And I um, started souring it right away with just lacto. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually learned a lesson from a previous beer that when you're just doing lacto, it doesn't really establish itself as quick as yeast. So you really got to be careful about sanitation. Um, right. <laughs> Going in. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I learned that I have a house culture, definitely. And it's not a pleasant one. So I decided that, I'd like Jesse mentioned um doing with his beer just doing it in the kettle that way there was less chance of getting infection from any you know of your equipment that you might not have sanitized quite as well as you thought you did mm-hmm. so i just pitched lacto after making a starter straight in there and it just you know it took a little while to take off but it, when it did it started really going and i kind of like just kept it around 90 just by turning the stove on and off and i got a pretty reasonable amount of soundness after like two to three days but i think i might have accidentally I, at some point during that period, I accidentally turned up too high and killed it off, but it was right. pleasantly sour. So wait, that was, you. so the second time you did it, you added lactobacillus after you were done with the boil. After I was done with the boil. Okay, so at the very end, but you yeah. kept your beer in the kettle instead of putting it in a yeah. fermenter. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so there's, li- I, the only reason I did it, like I mentioned, was just so there was no risk of contaminating with anything else. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. And how did that bur- beer turn out? It turned, it was all right. I mean, I think I might have killed it off a little too soon. Mm-hmm. Um, it was tart, but it wasn't as tart as, as I was expecting. I mean, I think my plan was to sour it for um, about a week, just with the lacto, and then come in with the yeast to finish it off. Right, but right. It never really got to that point where it was quite sour enough again. But yeah, yeah. I it's that's a thing. I think lacto is very tricky. Um, I've used lactobacillus several times in my brewing. Um, the Berliner Weiss that I did, and I think you kind of did this as well. I base it on Christ- Kristen England's recipe in um, mm-hmm. the book mm-hmm. Brewing with Wheat by Stan Hieronymus. I think it's an excellent technique. Um, and I did also, I used six pounds of German Pilsner and three pounds of German wheat. I did a 133 degree for an hour, and then I infused at 152. And then I actually decocted at 160 to 166, and that's when I added my hops. And I mm-hmm. used Haller Tower hops. Um, and I did not do a boil. Um, I also, at the end of the uh, mash, I rested at 166 for 30 minutes. Um, and then sparge, this is before I did brew in a bag, so I, did it, I was doing traditional all grain. Mm-hmm. Um, I chilled to 77. I, pack, I pitched two packets of Y yeast lacto and one Safe Ale 05. I'm a huge fan of Safe Ale 05. Um, and then actually that was in my base. I think my, my basement was around 77, maybe a little hot 
warmer. It was at the end of July in 2010. And so I brewed this beer 725 2010. It was done. It was down to 1000 by 82. So I don't know, like two weeks later, I bottled it on 8.7. It was very sour. Uh-huh. Um, the other thing is, so we're actually drinking the, the, the Fritz Bream's 1809 right now. I think this is not extraordinarily sour, but very, it's a beautiful beer. Yeah, it's, I would say it's about the same tartness as I got um, mm-hmm. from the kettle. Because um, I, I had I had the Carlin's beer and it was really sour. It was like pleasantly tart. Yeah, and I think, so, so going back, I mean, Berliner Weiss, hopefully all of you guys have, have t- tasted Berliner Weiss that are, um, that are listening out there, but Berliner Weiss is a, a German beer. It's low in alcohol, usually like three to three to three and a half percent, somewhere around that. It has a percentage of wheat in the in the grist, um, and it's sour in some ways. And there's a number of ways you can sour. So Matt and I have been talking about souring afterward with lactobacillus, um, which is a bacteria that produces lactic acid. You can also do, as Jesse Ferguson spoke to us earlier, souring in the kettle. Or you can start with a sour mash. So you're doing something similar to what Jesse described with your sour mash, but instead um, you're you're actually letting your mash sour. Now you can do this, I think, I have not actually done a sour mash yet, um, but I believe you can do this at the beginning of the mash or, af- or after you mash. Um, I was actually listening, I'm going to, we'll put a, bu- I'll put a bunch of links um, on, on our fermentaboutit.com to some really good resources if you're interested in brewing Berliner Weisses and Gretzers. Um, there's some very good podcasts. I know that Jamil Zanishev did a, a very good podcast on Brewing Network, on Brewing a Berliner Weiss. And then um, Basic Brewing Radio also has a couple of excellent shows on Brewing Berliner Weisses as well. So I'll add those links because we just can't cover it all today. But Berliner Weiss, it's one of my favorite styles. I love sour beers, and I love low-alcohol beers. And this is just, it's the best thing. I could drink it year-round, but it's especially good in the summer. Um, so, oh, the other thing is, so I think one thing, so I had made this this Berliner Weiss, and it soured in just a few weeks, actually. I think I had it at, at, a, at the good temperature to do that. Lactobacillus, is, as Jesse mentioned, it really likes to be hot. It likes 90 to 100 mm-hmm. degrees maybe even a little higher. Um, I actually brewed a smoked wheat, which we're going to taste next. Um, I brewed a smoked wheat. Um, one of my favorite styles, another style, a German um, wheat beer is called Lichtenhainer, and that's actually a sour smoked beer. Again, low alcohol, 2.9, 3.1%. I had a, my first... Ooh, this is very carbonated. Oh, my. Oh, my. Okay. I had my very first Lichtenhainer at... Um, a brew festival in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and it was brewed by, uh, it was a collaboration brew between Marzoni's Pizza and East End Brewery, and they did, I just was blown away by this beer. I'd never heard of a Lichtenhainer. I had no idea what it was, and it was just fantastic. So that was actually, I've kind of been on this quest to brew this perfect Lichtenhainer, um, which marries, you know, my love for sours and my love for smoke. So I actually made an imperial Lichtenhainer. Immediately, the day that I bottled this, um, my, my Berliner, I made an imperial Lichtenhainer, and I basically just racked this beer directly onto this cake. And let me tell you, I brewed this on um, August 7th, and it was sour as all get out on August 12th, actually, five days later. So I think that's something to keep in mind. If, you, if you're really interested in making very clean lacto-sour beers, once you make your first one, you build up your lacto culture. I think you can reuse that yeast and pitch onto it, and that's a way to get very quick souring. Um, so I just poured Matt. I'm, I've got to finish my 1809. So what do you think of it? So anyway, I, I actually have some of these. This smoke sour. It's two and a half years old. I, it was in the carboy for a couple of years, and then um, I bottled it in June. And it, it's sour. It's uh, it's a lot more sour than 1809. It's actually yeah. what I expect from uh, Berliner Weiss, but it has that hint of smoke that really comes in that you wouldn't really expect to find in a sour, and it's yeah. kind of very pleasant. Almost. And I, I don't know if I... I mean, an Imperial Licking Hater, I mean, it's a lot of sour. This beer is incredibly sour um, with a hint of smoke. There's not as much smoke left as there was originally. Right, right. Um, how, how big is this in terms of alcohol? Um... I think it probably finished like almost nothing. Oh, okay. And it started at ten fifty two. Oh, so. right. So it's like almost six percent. Yeah, I think I think I can remember it being like five six when I bottled it, maybe. Oh, okay. And it's probably gone a little further since then. Um, 
But anyway, these are just th- things to keep in mind. Um, souring options. I think, you know, you can use lactobacillus. You can use either in your mash ton or your kettle or with combination of your yeast. Actually, I went to, Matt and I were talking before the show, I was at the National Homebrewers Conference in Seattle this summer, and there was an excellent talk on Berliner, uh, Berliner Weiss as a style and, and how to get the proper sourness. And their technique was to, um, was actually to pitch lactobacillus for seven days and then pitch, they used a German ale yeast. That was the best result. And they got the, the perfect, you know, sour and, and maltiness that they wanted. The other thing to keep in mind is that lacto actually does not like oxygen. And you want, to discu- you want to discourage something like acetobacter from growing, which does like oxygen. So as Jesse said, he purged his kettle. So if you're going to do any, regardless if you do a sour mash or sour in the kettle or you're fermenting with lactobacillus, you want to keep oxygen out of there. So you can do plastic wrap on the top if you are doing a sour mash or sour kettle or you can purge with co2 um once you know once if you're if you're actively fermenting alongside uh, saccharomyces you don't need to worry about that as much because obviously it's, it's blowing off uh, co2 but otherwise that that is one kind of guideline to keep in mind you want to keep oxygen away mm-hmm. from your fermenting beer or your sour mash Let's see. I lost my train of thought. Let's go on to Grazers. Oh, yeah. So, Matt, what is a Grazer? Uh, gra- uh, Grazer is um, a, more or less a dead Polish <laughs> German style that was popular in the world, apparently. And it was made mostly with a uh, hundred smoke um, wheat. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of, since I think brewing with wheat has come out, it's kind of got a... Uh, miniature revival yes um, i agree i know the uh Weyermann, one of the, the popular german monsters just came out with uh oak smoked wheat just for making gretzers which i think um is pretty interesting given that it's like a obscure style that died out in the 90s so. absolutely absolutely i i agree so the first time i was introduced to this style was um actually paul who owns blind bat brewery on long island he made i think it's called vlad the inhaler and it's it was Gritsky and I tasted this at I think a Long Island a charity event on Long Island. I thought it was amazing beer. Mm-hmm. Now Paul, this was before Wireman came out with the smoked the wheat oak smoke wheat. He brew, he actually smokes his own wheat malt. So I had made actually a, a Gretzer a couple years ago, and I also had smoked my own wheat malt in my backyard, um, and had wonderful results. Now Matt and I were talking our technique for doing Gretzer, and also. Um, on a side note, the Zymergy Magazine, which is a, the uh, journal of the American Homebrewers Association, their, actually their current issue, the November-December 2012, has an excellent article on Gretzers. Um, so I would highly recommend if you subscribe or if you're a member of the AHA, you get this magazine. But definitely look it up if you're interested in, in, in Gretzky or, or Gretzer beer. That's, they really cover it. But I didn't sour mine, and Matt didn't either. Mm, no. Yeah, and I know the uh, professor. Bream, he kind of uh, soured his, and I'm. Yeah, and there are references. I mean, I, right. I've done read a lot about it. We were talking about this earlier as well. I've read a lot about it, and some reports are that it soured. Now, whether that was intentional or not, we don't know. Mm. And of course, I mean, these are not set styles. We're home brewers. We can do whatever the heck we want. Right, I mean, right. all of these styles, especially the dead ones, are open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. So always keep that in mind. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about the Gretzer. So you 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 made one more recently with the Wireman malt, correct? Yeah, and I used a hundred percent oak smoke wheat. I think. Uh, for the evolution of the style, mm-hmm. it was uh, a lot more known for uh, just being wheat, straight wheat rather than barley, which mm-hmm. I think presents a lot of challenges for most homebrewers. But I do a lot of brew in the bag, so it was Same barely, yeah. barely easy. You just yes. lift the bag up and there's no sparging involved. Yeah. <laughs> so I just did 100% oak smoked wheat. I think I did two rests, like a protein rest and a sacrification rest around like 150 in the protein rest was around 120 mm-hmm. and that was basically it um i think the one uh difference between uh our two gretzers was that i i t- i hopped it a lot more with mm-hmm. like low alpha acid um sots mm-hmm. because i had read um Kristen england who had kind of pres- uh, wrote the recipe for the gretzer in the brewing with wheat he he had a comment on the internet about adding a lot of low alpha acid noble hops and getting rid of that tannic kind of flavor coming in there. And I found that kind of worked in the be- final beer in terms of like um, 
balancing out the smokiness in some ways. Yes. So. I agree. And I think, you know, Dr. Fritz Bream talked about balancing out smokiness with some sourness. And I think that's also true. I did not do that. I made a very, I don't have my recipe in front of me, unfortunately, but I made a very low hopped beer and man, it was like smoked ham in a glass, which was p- perfectly fine with me since I love smoked beers. But I think this is a style that, again, as I said, it's open to interpretation. So it can be whatever you want it to be. Mm-hmm. And it really, um, it begs to be experimented with. So as we talked about, the Wireman is available. I actually have a bag at home that I ordered to make a Gretzer and have right. not made it yet. Um, but it's a very drinkable, again, lower alcohol beer. How, do you remember what your ABV was? I think I came in at like 2.8. 2.8, yeah. yeah. And the thing about these these kind of beers, the, the Berliner Weiss or the Lichtenhainer or the Gretzer, is that although they're very low alcohol drinkable beers, they have a lot of flavor either due to the, the acidity and and tanginess caused by the lactobacillus or the smokiness um, from the malt or, you know, a combination of both. So I think that's that's one thing when you're approaching making a low alcohol beer is where is your flavor coming from? And and at the, uh, you know, lactobacillus and, and the smoke malt are two great ways to get mm-hmm. a lot of flavor in a low alcohol beer. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say with the Gretzer, you may be a bit weary about using all smoke malt, right. but the final product that's, wasn't that smoky at all. Which that's was true. Surprising. I agree. I agree. So. E- yeah, even when I smoked my own malt, it was it was pretty low key. It actually kind of somehow melds in the in the whole thing. So obviously, if you're doing a traditional all grain batch for Gretzer, you would have to use a lot of rice hulls. Um, for people that are doing brew in a bag, it's not an issue at all um, because we're not doing a sparge. So. You don't have to worry about that. It's very, I mean, that is what brew in a bag is brilliant for, is, is for dealing with these very sticky grains like wheat and rye. So we're going to wrap it up. I do, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, this was our sixth episode, and we're, this is the last episode of 2012. We're off for Christmas Eve, and we're off on uh, New, Year's Eve, New Year's Eve. So I think we return on, um, I believe it's January 7th. And I've already booked the first several shows, but just to give you guys a preview, um, we're going to be talking about brewing with honey. And Peter Hepp from uh, Italy's Bereria is going to be with us. He's brewed a number of honey beers um, that are quite delicious. We're very excited to have him on. And then uh, January fourteenth, we're going to we're going to go to non beer. We're going to talk about kvass, and we're going to have a very special guest, uh, Dan Woodski, who wrote the book on kvass. He is owner of a brewery in Western Pennsylvania. So I'm really excited about those two shows. And we have a bunch more shows planned for you next year. Um, The other thing is, oh, just a reminder, uh, Porter Restore is another Sandy Benefit on Staten Island. It's going to be December 23rd. Chris Kuzme and I uh, will be pouring beer and actually homemade soda at that event. You can go to porterrestore.com to get your tickets. There was something else I had to tell you guys. Oh, I know. The other thing is, ah, if you're looking for last-minute holiday gifts, a membership to heritageradionetwork.org is a great one, either for yourself or your homebrewing friend. So they actually have different membership levels. The basic is only $60. And for homebrewers, it's great because your membership card gets you 5% off at both Brooklyn Homebrew and Bitter and Esters, and then actually a dollar off all pints at Jimmy's number 43. So if you're a homebrewer, this is a really great value. You're going to support our show and and this wonderful station that allows us to have the show and then you also get a a great discount at at a couple local homebrew stores so i'd like to thank matt chan for being with me today and jesse ferguson for calling in earlier happy holidays happy new year i look forward to talking about more home fermentation in 2013 cheers Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. 
Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.